That is the best. I don't even when people say something very simple like, "Can I have this?" I'm like, "Fuck yeah, you can." <laughs> I never would have known that that's what you wanted right now. And it's like, you know, when you're I mean, it's nice to rock someone's world totally spontaneously and by accident. But it's also nice when people can take the guesswork out of it. And I really think it's way more sexy than being like, what can I do for you? What do you want? Like, I think it's like, it puts a lot of pressure on me when people ask me what I want. But if I know how to just ask for what I want, I think it's hot. If I feel powerful and that person feels empowered to please me. Hello and welcome to Here in L.A., Historic Core Edition. Today we talk with Zora Bannon. Zora models, but don't call her a model. She's a private chef, and if you eat her food, beware. You'll end up under her spell. Zora's a native Angelina who has a podcast, I mean a webcast, I mean a web series where she talks about sex with a diverse assortment of beautiful women. Which is interesting because during our first interview, she didn't bother to mention that until I was packing up. And I said, what? And and then I said, I think I'm going to have to come back here again. And so I did. So that's just one reason this interview is so long. But it's good. Strap in as we meet your pal, Zora Bannon. Hey, everybody. I am here in downtown L.A. with Zora Baron. <laughs> oh, no. That's terrible. No, it's not. Who am I here with? Zora Bannon. Z- Zora. Zora. Baron. Bannon. Bannon. Yeah. Bannon. Bannon. Yeah, so the, the last N is a little bit on the silent side. So Bannon. Uh, I is don't that- like to say it in English because it sounds a lot like another person's name who is widely detested um is it french yeah are you from france no (laughs) i'm not and you know what i mean obviously it's like i could get french citizenship apparently um my dad has french citizenship my family's moroccan um but apparently the name the last name offers us and our lineage with the name offers us the right to french citizenship um so i really need to get on that but just just having a name allows you to be yeah, a dual think, passport well, holder. If you have the paperwork, I think, that goes with the name that says your ancestors were here during this time, I think it does. I think French people have tried to change the law around that because French people have been, like, flying around spreading their seed and now all these, like, half-bloods are, like, coming trying to be French and French people hate that. But um, normally, yeah, I should be able to get a French passport. Do you parlay Francais? Oui, je parle Francais. Oh, how about that? That's a that? terrible, I'm forcing an accent, but oui, je parle Francais. Nice. Does this make you African American? Oh my God, that's so funny. People used to ask me that in middle school and high school all the time. And I think I just left the question open. I was like, I don't know, <laughs> because I was a kid. And I think, like, secretly, you know, was obsessed with like hip hop and RB and like was like, sure whatever gets me closer to that makes me cooler um but no i i don't think so because i think that i mean yes and no right i am of african descent and i am north african i feel like maybe people feel more comfortable with the word north african um who cares what they feel well because africa's I, africa sure well i think that people think africa and they think um black people You know, and in North Africa, it's kind of known that that's kind of more, at least now, um, you know, Arabs. So I think that people who refer to Africa as like the ancestral home of black people want there to be some people, some people who I have known and dated who are black are like, you're black. And I'm like, "Uh, I'm not I don't think that's cool. I'm definitely not going to say that. And they're like, well. And it's been an argument back and forth, and I'm, like, very uncomfortable with it. So I like to say North African because it's more accurate, I guess. Are both of your parents from Morocco? So my mom is actually born in Israel, born in Tel Aviv. But um, her mom is from Morocco and, like, went to Israel while she was pregnant with my mom, I think. 
So my mom was almost born in Morocco, but huh. not. But basically everyone on my mom's side of the family before my mom was born in Morocco. And so is my dad and his whole family. And I did some uh, Facebook sleuthing of you last night because we've never met. <laughs> yeah. Hi, we we have a similar friend. And the reason that I'm interviewing you is because you did an amazing Facebook post um, not long ago. And you were nice enough <laughs> to accept my request. So anyways, I, I rarely do I not know anything about the person I'm about to talk to. Oh, okay. Cool. So I just dug around your Facebook like a snoop <laughs> and saw that your dad seems to be right now in Casablanca. Yeah, that's that. That's totally right. That's where my dad lives. Have you With, been there before? Yes, I have. Um, so my dad moved back to Casablanca when I was four. And then I got the fun job of, well, my parents hate each other. So I had to like get passed around and I would go like uh, an unaccompanied minor flying back and forth from the age of four. I don't know what age they let people do that now. Wow. But from the age of four, I started just doing things three trips a year sometimes, but usually two going to Morocco and back. So 14, 15 hour like flights usually cut in half, but still 15 hours with a stranger who seems annoyed by you in the airport waiting in like uh, stewardess lounges or, you know, like just not fun at all. I, this to this day, why I hate airplanes. I hate really because it's I don't think that most kids have that much exposure to airplanes as like young people and my ears would get clogged and but one time I did get to sit next to one of the Baldwin brothers <laughs> because my ears got clogged in an airplane at like five six years old and so they had to take me to first class to like bring down the pressure and so I got to sit next to him I had no idea who he was obviously so I'm just like chatting his ear off and he gave me gum and it really helped and then he drove me to my family when we got to the airport and uh, he had one of those like special carts that pick you up. And I never see those anymore, but those like golf carts in the airport. And he brought me to my aunt and my aunt was like, is this my gift from Hollywood? And, like <laughs> what's going on? Um, but yeah, lots of traveling back and forth. And I went to school there. My mom was... Um, you know, in a bad financial situation, one of the times when I was a kid, it got so bad that she couldn't take care of me anymore. So she sent me to Morocco to live there and I went to school there and I actually really enjoyed it. My memories are great. I had a, I lived, my dad's apartment was above a dance school studio. So it could not have been better for me. I just spent like five hours a day sometimes in dance classes. And I mean, I was very happy there. I love it there. What, uh, I, I mean, when I think of Morocco, <laughs> is it what Tell Morocco me. is really like? I don't know. What do you think? I think of uh, arch doorways. Uh-huh, yeah. Uh, magic totally carpets, obviously. That. Absolutely. Um, Everywhere. Belly dancers. Mm -hmm, yeah. Totally uh, nice. Sand dunes and camels. You know, I haven't been, but it exists. <laughs> I, it's really sad. I, there, I haven't been to the Sahara and experienced that, but it is there. All of the things you said are super accurate, but it's also like a very modern third world country. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, they're, they're, they seem to be like <laughs> a few years behind the United States all the time. Like, you know, they still had dial up while we were like <laughs> definitely exited from that. And, you know, they had Internet cafes. I think they still have Internet cafes and just certain things. But it seems like now technology has kind of like reached a point where everybody's kind of on the same page. I always say that Morocco is like the Mexico of Africa. Mm. Um, the people there could not be friendlier and more generous and wanting of you to have like a good experience and hospitable. And obviously people get a little bit turned off by the like hustle that people mm. have there. They're like, here, come buy this. You want da 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 $5, $2, $3, $10, <laughs> you know, like, but it's like, yo, those people are trying to feel, feed six kids. And like mm. they didn't graduate the fifth grade, but they speak 15 languages and know how to interact with every tourist that comes here. Like, can you respect the hustle and right. just walk by and be like, no, thanks. No, thanks. But people are so sensitive about people trying to push stuff on them. And it's like, this is what this the world was before. Mm -hmm. And you want this experience. It comes with the like, you know, 
hanging carpets and you know it comes with that whole mystique of Arab culture and the casbah and all that shit that you saw in Aladdin as a kid <laughs> like it comes with the kind of like try to rip you off selling guy mm-hmm. and no matter what you buy there it's going to be a million times cheaper than here even if you're getting ripped off by their standards you still saved like these fucking poofs <laughs> these Moroccan poofs uh, my dad would kill me I ordered them so that I could do my podcast and have cool like Moroccan seating and they were $175 each Whoa! to get sent here from Morocco by this person. I was like, I'm going to go to Morocco. I'm going to fill a suitcase. I'm going to come here and start my own Etsy because like, what the hell? Um, And they're like $40, $30 there. Mm. Maybe not even. It's, it's hard to me. It it can't, you can't even imagine how cheap it is there. Maybe it's like 20 bucks for one. So um, at some point you moved back to LA permanently how old were you when that happened um so it's i mean i i only lived in morocco for two years okay um and it was like from a little like 12 to almost 14 i think so you went to high school out here not even it's like 11 to almost 13 11 to almost 13 um i did go to multiple high schools out here so because you parlay front says mm-hmm. when I uh, Facebook sleuthed you, mm-hmm. I saw that you went to a uh, French speaking wow, high school. Deep. Okay, Is this the one um, over by the Fox uh, movie studios? So I went to the Lycée Francais, um, which is the one I think you're talking about. Like Because you know, I can't pronounce it. Lycée Francais <laughs> um, in the third grade. So like, uh, is that Westwood? It's yeah. Westwood adjacent. Yeah. What's that golf course called? Because that's Rancho what, Park. Rancho. Yeah. So I think that the Rancho neighborhood is yeah, the neighborhood. Yeah, totally. I do remember that. And it was such a great school. And I got really good grades there. And I still had like a very active parent. Like I had a stepdad who really cared about my school stuff. He was invested in that. And there was fencing. Ooh. And I was a fencer. And there was a swimming pool. And it was like. That school has a swim pool right there? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Very different from the tiny little French school I went to on top of a hill in Los Feliz, um, right under the Shakespeare Bridge. You oh, know what I'm talking about? Like yeah. on the way to Marshall, under the yeah. Shakespeare Bridge, there's a little French school. A and petite school. A petite French school. <laughs> and they have nothing. Their classrooms are literally bungalows, like, and always were. It wasn't like, we have too many kids and we have to at- do this addition of bungalows. Like, it was always bungalows. There's nothing there. Um, did you have a choice on the well, schools? No, I don't think so. I think I went to the... I don't, so my situation with my mom is that she has like fluctuating financial situations. Mm. And so actually I dropped out of high school and I went to 17 schools before that. So I went to four high schools in three years of high school. Wow. And yeah. <laughs> in, in, in what neighborhoods? <laughs> Um, Were you guys moving? We moved around LA a lot. Right. I went to one high school in Las Vegas. Oh, um, but three here. So I went to Fairfax High School. Nice. And I hold went, on. What year? Oh God, oh three. I think two thousand and three. Fairfax High. Fairfax High. Yeah, because I think I remember being a freshman and seeing all of the seniors throwing up this like okay sign or whatever <laughs> um but it was like oh three and like it's oh a, mm-hmm. it's like a, when i went there it was like mostly black and hispanic students um which made the culture there amazing like I, the sports teams were amazing yeah the, the high school like school spirit it, like kind of like in the movies it was crazy i mean that's why i ask about fairfax is because it seems like the idyllic Hollywood, California high school Holy. with Melrose as your backyard. Like, and it's I crazy. Went, I went to Hollywood high school and it was not like that. What was Hollywood high school like? Um, it was um, definitely more white kids. And this, I think what happens, what I've noticed is that, or at least of the four high schools I went to, it seems very important. If your school's going to have school spirit, the sports teams have to be really good. And so at Fairfax, they care about football and they're invested in their athletes are amazing. Um, They definitely had 
a amazing school spirit and their teams won a lot of the time. The the difference between in that and Hollywood was that like people were like sneaking in crystal meth. Like the popular kids were all on like serious drugs and had like problems with like addiction and like attendance, which I also had problems with attendance, but I did not I smoked weed. Um I start I smoked a lot of weed, but besides that I didn't do anything. And all the other there was like a lot of like Russian kids, like Slavic, like such a huge Russian population in Hollywood. And I don't know, they were like kind of like I mean, whatever. I definitely was not popular, you know. Uh I was kind of a loner because I like moved around a lot. I was not I was not like a nerd, which now is like I wish I was, but um, I was not a nerd, but I was not popular because I just was new. I was always the new girl, so I didn't have any history with anyone there, and it's kind of hard to, like, get popular if you don't really have history. Mm-hmm. Um, Did you, were you in any clubs or uh, So, yeah, sports? so the, usually I was in some kind of performance, whatever, but uh, at Fairfax, I was um, very briefly on the hip-hop team. And, um, I hip hop dancing, hip hop dancing. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then, uh, I was well, in some kind well, of theater there, but, but okay. So Fairfax has all these black and Hispanic people. Mm-hmm. The hip hop club must've been amazing, right? Amazing. And I was like one of two or non-black people to be accepted into that, which was cool, but it was very brief. Cause I ended up snitching <gasps> accidentally oh. on I didn't snitch yeah yeah I kind of snitched well I don't know I like well, it was my freshman year of high school and I had come from like kind of a private school homeschooling background and just to give you a short so, version of the story um I'm trying to remember oh so it was like I think it was summer school maybe and like three consecutive days in a row I brought twenty dollars to class and like an idiot three consecutive days in a row I somehow allowed that $20 to get stolen from my bag and okay it happens to you once maybe you misplaced it It happens to you twice that's weird it happens to you three times somebody's taking it yeah and so I went to the office to just be like hey like I keep bringing money for school and somebody's taking it from me and they were like okay we'll just go back to class and we'll be there and I don't know Like, I just thought a teacher was going to come in and be like, hey, who's stealing money from this girl? It's not nice. But actually, two cops came and lined everybody up and, like, singled me out and made me check that their money. They made them. They searched all their stuff and then was like, is this your money? Is this your money? Is this your money? And it's like everybody had, like, fives or singles or, you know, they all had change. And I had, like, a $20 bill. So, A, nobody had my money. But then B, people had like drugs and baggies and <laughs> knives and like all this kind of shit that I could not have anticipated that they were going to find. And so then like all these like Hispanic girls were very mad at me at the end of the day. And I was like, holy shit, I'm so sorry. I had no idea that was going to happen. I got my ass beat uh, <laughs> right in front of the school, too. They didn't give a fuck. Like the second I stepped out off the steps of the school my friend actually came to meet me at the end of school and like a circle of girls came and just started like ripping my hair from different directions until i was on the ground like holding my forearms over my face and they just were like kicking me and my friend was a guy and he was standing there just kind of watching like dumbfounded because he also went to that tiny petite french school and he was like (laughs) what the hell is happening here sacre bleu sacre bleu Let's talk about your apartment real quick. Okay. This is a great place. You like it? I, what's not to like? I don't know. This looks like real hardwood floors. Mm-hmm. You have a piano in here. I know. With a skull on top of it. Right. I, see... I got to get rid of that skull. It's like bringing weird vibes. No. that. <laughs> you think so? I mean, I used it for a Halloween photo shoot. <laughs> And then I was like, this is cool decoratively. But when I see it, it just doesn't work. Creeps you out a little bit, a little dark. I'm just like, why? 
He's he's just chilling. Yeah, maybe I'll put like some air plants in it or something. <laughs> put a hat on him. I'm just like, I see a couple guitars, acoustic guitars. Yes, I have lots of instruments from my attempts to become a musical person. I see roller skates, like old school roller skates. Mm, yeah. I love roller skating. It was definitely saved my life during COVID. And then you have this cute couch and a background, a velvet curtain background with two lights on either side of it. It looks kind of like a a stage almost or a, right? Yeah, like if it wasn't I wasn't on I didn't do that on I didn't do any of this on purpose. Like all of these are items. Like for the first three and a half, four years that I lived here, maybe five, it looked like I had just moved in because I was pretty much ready to leave. I was like, I'm going to leave. I'm moving to another country. I'm going to do something exotic. I'm a minimalist. I want to have all my stuff that fits into two suitcases. And da, 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 and I had nothing. And then a lot during quarantine, actually, I started like being like, all right, I'm going to pay more attention to my space. Would it be okay for you to live here for a few more years? I mean, I think so. I think at this point in my life, this is my like carry sex in the city apartment, right? And then the next move I make, I mean, look, I have reasonably high ceilings yeah i have tons of windows the light in here is amazing the square footage is decent 700 square feet Mm -hmm. and the rent is 1500 dollars a month like that's amazing it's amazing i would i would have not expected that when i moved in here it was more than i had ever paid on my own but now i'm like i'm not gonna find anywhere no that has this and even i've looked because there's there's little noises in this apartment, and I'm very sensitive to noise. So I've definitely looked to move downtown even. Mm-hmm. There's nothing. Everything is like staring at a brick wall. Like, yeah. I have, I'm one floor from the top floor. I have a view of all the buildings. Great view of all the buildings. You are in, what? what's this part of downtown called? It's the historic core. Historic core. So also, so like jewelry district adjacent. Right. Yeah. So when you need some gold. Right behind Pershing Square, like right by there. But uh, now you you made me some <laughs> gourmet uh, appetizers, which we'll have another bite of. Yeah. That are really, really good. Mm-hmm. But as somebody who likes to eat out a lot, mm-hmm. I'm super envious of all of your choices. You should be. Right. And like the oldies but goodies are still there. Thank God. What are your oldies but goodies? Mm. Well, for example, Shabu Shabu House in Little Tokyo. I've been going there since I was like four years old or six years old or something. Is that Second Street? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite food, Shabu Shabu. (laughs) At least it has been consistently for the last three years. I think it might change. Because you get to have a little control over your food? You know what? It's not even that. It's just... it's The reason why I say favorite food is because I think of favorite food as that like if you could only eat one thing for the rest of your life. And there is something that feels healthy about cooking in water and just having a plate of vegetables with, you know, thinly sliced protein and then two sauces, which are, it's like a sesame sauce and a ponzu. Like Mm -hmm. it's not that unhealthy. There's a little sugar in there, but, and then a bowl of rice that you can omit or use. And I do both. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And I don't know, it just feels really, really healthy. Like it feels clean and good and and delicious. Like they're just flavors that never get boring to me. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny. Every time I go to Shabu Shabu, I love just sitting there and watching because everybody Shabu Shabu is different. There really is no way to do it. I've seen people like, like I just do it the regular way. I feel like I put the meat and the vegetables in the water. I cook the meat. I like my meat medium rare. So I like it pink. And then I put it in the sauce and I eat it over rice. It's not that complicated. But some people do this thing where they like put chili powder and ponzu sauce or soy sauce and oil all over their meat. And then they like fold it up so it like absorbs and marinates. And then they like dip it in and, or like, you know, they cook everything at once. Or Everybody has their own way. So there's like, I don't know, something interesting about watching it and doing it. I have my own shabu shabu pot. I do it at home a lot now. To really? Be mm-hmm. Wow, you do love it. I love it. Um, but, you know, Bestia is still here. Mm-hmm. And uh, what else is around that's, like, been here forever? You know Hama Sushi? Yeah. Yeah. I love that place. That's across I, from the Shabu Shabu place. It is right there. And there's, like, a sushi chef there. His name's Ko.
I I like to tell people that the longest relationship I was ever in was with weed. <laughs> and that when I broke up with her for the third time, she was like, that's it. You're not coming back to me, bitch. Wow. Because now, or at least the last time, which is a long time ago that I smoked weed, I just was like, take me to the hospital. I'm having a mental breakdown. Like, you know, it was just like, I couldn't even under, I couldn't even, all I understood about paranoia back when I was like a huge pot smoker was that I th- thought that people thought that the cops were going to burst in from wherever. Like, you know, I just thought that people thought they were going to get caught and that's what it meant to be paranoid. Right. I didn't realize that it was like fear for no reason is what paranoia actually means. Um, and yeah, I just start getting really scared. I'll be like, I can feel my blood running through my veins. That's not normal. I'm going to die. Like take me right. to the hospital. <laughs> Um, you might be better off. Weed's not for everybody. Totally. Your video the other day was fantastic. Thanks. You were so spontaneous and random. Did you get a lot of comments for, for it? I did. Yeah, it was very weird. A lot of people were like, I love story time. Da, yeah. da, this is great. More of this. I was like, I was really just trying to pass the time because I was at the comedy store and they try to freaking gouge you there like it's the airport. <laughs> And they wanted me to, from Hollywood to downtown, to charge me $50 for an Uber at like 11 p.m. I was like, there's no way. So I just decided to walk. I was like, I don't even know how far I'm going to walk. I'm just going to walk. Do you have a car? No. That is awesome. (laughs) I haven't had a car for a decade. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you don't drink? No. And I was the first of my friends to get a car. And I love driving. But I mean, here, like why I don't have a car, why I haven't had a car. Uber used to be really cheap. Yep. Like it used to be super cheap. And parking here, just the parking lot rent alone is $250. Wow. So I was like, let's say I get a car. I don't want to buy another Craigslist lemon. I'm not 16 anymore. Like let's let's say I have a $400 car payment because my like credit's not like stellar. I only just started building it like a few years ago. Um, so like $400 got- plus $200 plus the $200, I would have been paying like $1,300 a month on my car. And I was just like, I've calculated, I've done my taxes and, you know, I was spending somewhere between 400 and on a really bad month, $600 a month on Ubers, just taking Uber everywhere mm. for years. So it seemed like a better deal. Just it get is, picked up and dropped off and not deal. And, but and now Uber is at $50 a pop. Like, it's insane. I can't. I can't. So so as you're walking down, um, what is that? Sunset Boulevard. Hollywood, I think. Is well, it? no, because you went to the Seven Vale. Is the Chateau Marmont? Oh, I guess. No. Sunset Chateau- Strip. Really? Yeah. yeah. Sunset. Okay. So the Chateau's on Sunset. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was wondering about that after I watched the video because I called it Sunset. And mm-hmm. I was like, is it Hollywood? Because I was like, I think Franklin's right above there. The only nice. reason I know this is because I was an Uber driver for five years. <laughs> yeah, but I should know this because I literally spent most of my, bring, well, as you heard, most of my upbringing there. And Which I was, said it right in the video, but then I questioned myself. So I'm glad you're confirming now. No, it was, it was okay. So you were walking down the street, talking about, reminiscing about growing up there. Mm-hmm. And one of the stories that you told was... Somehow you were a little girl and you had lost your mom and you, you didn't know where she was. Not the first time. And she probably went to buy cigarettes, to be honest. But And so you went to a strip club. You went to the Seven Vale strip club. Famous because Motley Crue used to go there all the time. Really? I didn't know. And it's, well, I think it's in the Girls, Girls, Girls song. Um, That's so funny. Raising hell in the seven veil. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, I guess I don't listen to a lot of Motley Crue, so. Well, you should pay attention to their yeah. lyrics. They, you know. Are poets. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Nikki Six, Big Mars. And so um, you went in there as a, as a little girl, and you said that you were totally taken care of by the strippers, and that wasn't the first time that you had been taken care of in a sweet way by strippers that's not true that well actually i mean it depends what you consider a stripper but as for sure for sure strippers that was my first experience with strippers and they were wonderful with me and every experience i've had since then like i recently went to atlanta and went to that like super famous strip club there that's like oh yeah i forgot the name of it but it's like known for 
I mean, they do crazy shit in there. Like the shit that I saw in those Atlanta strip clubs, <laughs> I've never seen before. But also the amount of money. Like they they invented make it rain in that strip club in Atlanta. <laughs> and I swear to God, they take a a wad of money. I have no idea how much money that is. Five thousand dollars. You know what I'm saying? Like, and they just throw it in the air and it like poofs into a cloud of dollar bills that rain down on everyone. It is insane. They, they literally have a bag of money and they just reach into this huge bag and throw it in the air. But yeah, that was my first time. I walked, the security guard was like, I was like, I can't find my mom. I Is she in here? Sunset Boulevard, Seventh Vale. What is that, La Brea over there? That near, uh, It's near? like right across, it's like right next to Rock and Roll Rounds. Right? Mm-hmm. So it's Poinsettia. Right. Um, Poinsettia and Sunset. And I when, lived when? in the Motor Hotel. Like, there. You, now I saw that it's called something else, like Sunset West Hotel. You, but there was, like, a motor hotel where, like, I guess truckers. I, why do they call it a motor hotel? Um, but it was just, like, <laughs> yeah, I, I lived in that shitty motel on Sunset. And, you know. With your mom? With my mom, yeah. For about how long? You know, it felt like a few months at that place. We lived in our car a couple times, and that was usually only a few days. And what kind of car? I feel like it was like a Mitsubishi, like some shitty old broke down Mitsubishi. And at the time when you're a little kid and you're homeless, I got to tell you that it doesn't feel like sad and dark. It feels like a camping trip with your parents. Have you seen the Florida Project? <clears throat> no. Oh, you're going to love it. <laughs> Because um, the little girl, the actor is named Brooklyn. I forget her last name. But it's Sean Baker is the director mm. who recently did Red Rocket. And he did Tangerine before that. God, I hated Red Rocket so much. You did? What did you hate about it? I hated the main character. He's, I, he wasn't a likable fellow. It was in, never have I seen, I walked out of the theater. Did you? Because never have I disliked someone so much and them have zero redeemable qualities like he just kept on piling on the hatred for that guy i have not walked out of a movie theater maybe in my life and i was like i can't take this it's too painful we have to leave I and i like that guy i was kind of like Simon I, rex i mean i i liked that i think i had a crush on him when i was little i think i saw him He's and i thought he was fella. cute yeah. Uh, now that I looked back at his catalog, I was like, what a piece of shit. But like as a kid, I didn't understand any of that. And I was like, he's cute. Um, <laughs> and I know that he kind of like disappeared and had his like Robert Downey Jr. moment. And so I like when it got, people have their moment to come back. And so I was like excited. And I saw the preview for this movie and I was excited for him. But I was just like, I mean, good for him for doing such an amazing job at acting that I needed to leave the theater from how much I hated him. It's just not the kind of experience I want to have as entertainment is disliking someone so heavily. You know, it's like I want to enjoy the people that I'm watching yeah, to some extent. and root for them. Or be impressed by them or something. But I just was like, I fucking want to dropkick this guy in the face. I hate him. Well, here's the crazy thing. I didn't like him before the movie. I watched the movie. Now I'm a fan. Yeah. Because it's an amazing performance. I I admit. Well, because I actually finished the movie Mm. and he does redeem himself a little bit. Does he? Yes. I remember leaving and being like, the only way he this movie can end at this point is that this girl fucks him over. You know? Is that that this young girl like sends him to prison or some shit like that. And that's how this movie ends. Like I'm not here to give any spoilers. <laughs> but um I totally understand why you leave. He's he's an unlikable character, which is a risky move by any filmmaker mm. to put because typically Totally, it's very European. Typically you put <laughs> you, you 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 put a sweet person in front of people sure. and then you fuck over their lives. And then you <laughs> yeah. watch that person like try to rebound. And usually they do rebound. Yeah. This or- was kind of the opposite. It was a bad person. But here's my point. Before he made that movie, he mm-hmm. made this movie called Florida Project, which was about very poor people living in a motel next door to Disney World in Orlando. Mm-hmm. And these poor kids, kind of like you, were like, oh, but it's fun to live super close to Disney World and see the fireworks every night. And we can explore sure. in these like really run down motels and we just weird stores meanwhile the parents were probably 
like freaking out. Mm. Like, how am I going to afford another month of living in this place? Totally. It's not a real home. I've, the kids have to study. <laughs> like, how do we do this? And so I think you might. I mean, I think about it sometimes. I've talked about it in therapy. And I think about, like, some of the memories include, like, okay, so the negative things, right? Like, living with your parent while they're stressed and having to observe that and kind of try to, like, shield yourself or comfort them, whatever that looks like. We're going to talk about downtown for a little while. And maybe you can answer these questions in a short way. Okay. Is it safe for a beautiful, young, French-speaking girl, woman, sorry? There's a short answer and there's a long answer. So I actually got physically assaulted within the last year. I've only been physically assaulted in downtown two times. And I've been, and once in Hollywood. And um, the last time that it happened. So I'm standing outside the building on a phone call crying with a boy. And, um, and this man walks up to me and I didn't go upstairs. It's like midnight and I didn't go upstairs because the phone call gets cut off in the elevator sometimes. So I'm like finishing this phone call and he's wearing a hat and a leather jacket. I didn't notice anything about him except that he seemed to be like curious about me because I was crying. I thought, Mm. and I was like, he kind of walked up to me and I thought he was inquiring about why I was crying, but I had headphones on. And so I was like, I'm on the phone, you know? And he was like, oh, okay. And like walked away from me. And I thought at first I thought that's nice that he was like checking on me, you know? And then he sat at the bus stop, which was like right in front here on Broadway. And there was also a woman at the bus stop, a homeless woman, which is like, they took the home, they took the bus stop off because it was just nonstop. Like, I mean, a homeless woman is fine, but it was just nonstop crazy people at that bus stop. Um, (laughs) And, you know, she had a blanket over her. She was very dirty and like potent smelling she had no shoes on her feet were so dirty and calloused and maybe like growing like she was just i'm not saying that she was ugly i couldn't even see what she looked like but there was yeah there was definitely something about her that was not inviting right you know um and she was probably struggling with like mental health problems but anyway so he sits on one side of the bus stop she's on the other side i don't really think much about it i'm like on the phone and then I look up at one point and he's like a little bit closer to her and I like go back to my conversation then 10 minutes later I look up again and he's like much closer to her and now he's like talking to her and I was like huh and you never know around here like maybe they know each other I don't know and then the next time I look up he has his arm around her and her face is this way and he's talking to her his her face is away from him away from him yeah her face is pointing in the other direction and so now I'm like, something's weird about this. I haven't told anybody, really. I, only my close friends know, my very close friends know about this story. But no matter how I tell the story, it makes me sound like I'm bragging about having done some cool shit. But I'm not telling you this because of this part. So just hold on for a second. <laughs> as far as crazy ass things that people have said to me walking by me, right also in front of my house here on Broadway. Um, a man leaned in. It doesn't matter. We won't. We just a man leaned into me and said, "My dick in your mouth." (laughs) Yeah, and I just was like, "Come, like dumbfounded that he tried." I mean, I didn't know what he looked like, but he tried to implant that image in my mouth. I was like, "What the fuck?" First of all, ew. Like, I feel dirty. Second of all. What is the goal with that? Am I supposed to turn around and be like, oh, my God, yes. Like, oh, that is all I want now. Give it to me. Like, I can't stop. Like, it's not like a pizza commercial. And now I have to fucking order Pizza Hut. That doesn't make sense. That'd be a great ad, though, Pizza Hut. (laughs) Or slice in your mouth. Yeah. I mean, you know what? That would work for me. But this was, it was so, I couldn't believe that men just walk around thinking that that kind of shit is okay. My dick in your mouth. Like, it's one thing to be like, hey, baby, you look sexy today. Like, whatever. Like, you know, but 
my dick in your mouth. You're a photographer. Mm -hmm. You're a model. You're a. I don't like that word. Are you though? No. This is why I say you probably are. I don't know any of these stuff. Okay. Cruising through your photos on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Really well done professional photos of you. I mean, I think that's just me having, being a photographer and having a lot of photographer friends. And then we take pictures of each other for practice or pleasure. And so I've been lucky enough to be in front of the camera with some amazing artists. And some people have just been like, I like your look. But I don't think, when I think model, I think like fitting certain stats. Like I'm 5'9", I'm 110 Have you gotten paid for your picture? Yes. Okay. Next. Okay. You take photos of food. It's true. So I have a food background. Food photography. (laughs) Oh, that's as simple as that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. food photography. So I have a background in personal chefing and food styling, which led me to get my own camera and kind of put those things together. And so I started a food media business. I have a website called goodtaste.media. And uh, that's just where I put my food photography. And I should update it with videos and shit. But yeah, companies hire me if they have a food product. I did all the content for Wetzel's Pretzels for a year. Like, Okay, um, let me ask you a quick question about food photography. Okay. I hear that you guys have to do things to that food. That's food styling. Oh. Which I've also done. But it's a different thing. Food photography means I put light and uh, a lens in front of food, and then I find the best angle. You don't spritz it with a little take bit it. of water? So that's food styling. Oh. Like, that's why. I was a food stylist, and I was like, I'm doing all the work, and then you come click your little button thing, and you make more money than me, which is why I started doing food photography. You were upset that, that you would style it, and the photographer would come in and make quadruple the money. Exactly. So you're like, bitch, I want all the money. Bitch. Yeah, exactly. I was like, I can do this. So now you get all the money. I do get all the money. Okay. For w- I hire food stylists now, actually, because it's not really? that easy to do. On a big job, it's not easy to do both jobs. I may, I may know somebody for you. A food stylist? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I know a bunch. Oh, do you? That's the problem, kind of. With I mean, I'm always looking for someone talented, but, like, here's the thing. At least for me, I prefer not to work with people who, like, paint their, you know, yeah. they, like, spray things and paint things and glue things. That's great if, if you have to, but I'd rather that it just be, like... The food, you know? Well, but so really when I hire a food stylist, it's someone who's plating I'm really interested in. Mm-hmm. Like their technique for, like, what are their tools as far as, like, creating a, an environment, like, around the food that looks really beautiful. Um, but if you're the, if you specialize in, like, super gluing ingredients together, like, that's not, it tweezers to, like, move food around. Yeah. Like, I get it, but. But, like, a Big Mac doesn't look like the poster. I and know. So in order so to those, make the, the poster. Fast food, yeah, right. I've been on like Oreo commercials and Taco Bell commercials. And actually, there's like very strict rules that you can't like what's in the photo has to be the exact ingredients that you serve. Mm-hmm. But there is someone there to make it by hand perfectly so that it looks a very specific way. And like the way that they do it is that they pack the front of the taco or something with all the ingredients <laughs> and then they'll like fill the rest of it with like paper or something so that it looks really packed like when you get a taco bell taco it's never stacked like that but it has to be to the ounce the exact amount of food that's in the the ones that they serve you or else it's a level of false advertising that is i want to be the cop i don't even want to be the stylist now (laughs) you want to be the measurer like oh uh." Uh, let's talk about your podcast okay it's called what girls want like why does everybody say want it's a really common thing like it says it in big punk letters with punk music in the background. And somehow like everybody comes back to me and is like, Oh, your thing's called what girls want. And I'm like, no, what girls like what girls like you got a couple R's in there. Yeah. A couple R's, no I. Cause it's a a tribute to the riot girl movement of the grunge era. Totally. Do you like any of those bands of that era? 
Um, I think I just wasn't exposed. I was such a little like R and B brat when I was a kid, and I wasn't exposed to that music as much. But I do really appreciate it, and mostly I appreciate like the female movement of anarchy mm-hmm. and kind of like breaking the rules and not giving a fuck. <laughs> I'm a giant Riot Girl fan. Oh wow! Because I'm a very old man, <laughs> and so I was in college when all that was happening. And I was on college radio when that was all happening. Oh, cool. And so it was It was probably impossible for just a regular person to just buy all these great singles and albums mm. back then. But when you work at a record sta- a radio station and all the records are there, mm. then you can listen to L7 or Babes in Toyland or mm. the the first whole record, you know, like things like that. And Well, you could probably give me a great education then. I'm going to have you send me a playlist. Okay. I mean, the, there, it was, it was, it was, well, okay. Talk about female empowerment. Because mm-hmm. a lot of these young ladies were pushing every boundary that they were taught as young girls on how it is to be a lady. And that's why I used it. That was where the inspiration came from, from that uh, part of the, the musical movement. Even though I appreciate the music, I'm not an expert in it, but... Um, just that fuck the rules part. So you were you, you were taught to be a, to do. you were <laughs> taught to be a proper lady as well. Definitely. I mean I'm from a I'm like half from a third world country. So it's a lot of like women have this very specific purpose and usefulness and fuck all that shit. <laughs> you have this amazing podcast. Well, it's not a podcast yet. Um, it was a web series. It started as a web series that I had in my brain for like six years. And do you want to know how it ended up in my brain? (laughs) Sure. Um, well, I was having a sexual interaction with a person and I'm so glad I asked. (laughs) And he was trying to give me, um, fellatio, I guess the cunnilingus. (laughs) Fellatio? That's right, right? That, that's the blowjob one? No, Colonel You're the expert. I know, I know. It's terrible. I'm not an expert. I'm about to tell you. I'm about to tell you how I'm not an expert. So he's going down on me and not being very successful. Mm. And I'm not a fake it person, but I'm also, at that time, was just kind of like, when you do it right, I will express myself. But until then, keep looking. <laughs> and so he asked me, what do you like? And I remember having so many feelings about that question and just being like, I don't know. I'm annoyed that you're asking me and that you don't know. And I feel like you should just be psychic or something. And, you know, (laughs) I left that interaction feeling a little bit frustrated. And then I was like, later on, like, why should he know? Like, how could he know? And why don't I know? And really why don't I know like 80% of my sexual interactions are not like up to par as far as I'm concerned and it's probably has a lot to do with the fact that I have no idea what I like and I also have never heard any language that like allows me to ask for it like all I've ever heard people women say sexually is like yes oh my god fuck me harder oh my god your dick is amazing blah blah blah. or like I want to do this to you but I've never heard a woman say I like it when you touch me like this or I really like to blah 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 it's just not what I've heard a lot of and so I was like I need to go on a mission talking to women who are fluent in their bodies or in sexuality and have them tell me like how the hell did you figure out what it is that you like sexually Um, and it took me on this journey that changed my life. Like in the way I thought, (laughs) I thought like, oh, maybe people will watch this and they'll, you know, it'll be like, oh, when you see somebody wearing something, you're like, I like those shoes. Like I'm going to get some (laughs) shoes like that, you know? And I thought that's what was going to happen. Like simply like you would pick and choose the things you liked and didn't like, and you would have these extra tools or language in your arsenal that you could use. But really what ended up happening was just just listening to women speak openly about these things that they liked unlocked my, I guess, shame box of fantasies. And like 
suddenly my own personal freak flag like could fly and I just realized I have all these fantasies that have nothing to do or some things to do with what these women talked about but I feel allowed now to express myself in this way that I didn't even realize how much I didn't feel allowed before I love that I love it too. I'm not going to lie. Like it, I didn't expect it to do all of that to me personally. And I can't speak to how it affects other people. And I'm grateful that anyone watches it and likes it. But um, yeah, it was very powerful for me in my personal sexual liberation. Sure. Well, you definitely had great guests who were experts, are experts, or at least they could communicate in an expert way. Totally. I call them sexual intellectuals. They are. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the ladies had um, kind of this chart, this like circle. Mm -hmm, yeah, the circle of consent. <laughs> and what I liked about that is, um, well, I'll tell you, coming from the Midwest um, as a virgin to California as a teenage boy wow. was mind altering. Were lots of people virgins like where in the At Midwest? My high school? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and very few of the girls in California were. And so it was... How old were you? I came here at 17. Okay. And I didn't lose my virginity till 21. But also, what year is this? That this matters. 1474. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> it was 1984. Okay. And it wasn't like things were uptight in California. Totally, yeah. Things were uptight in Illinois. Mm. Um, I mean, it's the 80s, like, I guess. You think the 80s would be... Chicago, right? Yeah, but this is kind of like the valley. All it's right. not like, you're not downtown. I mean, isn't that like where Wayne's World pretend to be from? I yeah. feel like I had this idea yeah. that it's like super cool. Aurora, Aurora's there. Aurora was in, from Wayne's World, mm -hmm. is in the same uh, division as us in high school. So people weren't fucking like, you know, animals there? Wayne's World came out in the 90s. Okay, yeah, sure. I just no, thought it was this representation of like they weren't, things that happened there. They and it wasn't because of religion. It was I, I, I wanna say it was for romantic reasons mm. that you wouldn't even kiss a girl unless you loved her, mm. kind of a thing. Like yeah. it was really sweet. And so even though <laughs> Where I, has that gone? No, I'm kidding, it's fine. <laughs> it's still there. It's, don't no. you don't you worry about it. It's, oh, you say you say it's gone? Not kissing a girl unless you love her? Well, I mean, one of the things that I loved about Kurt Cobain, talk about Riot Girls and all that, is Courtney would say that sex was super uh, a serious thing for her, him. Uh -huh. Like uh -huh. it was sacred. Uh -huh. And so he didn't, you don't hear stories about groupies with them, uh -huh. you know. And I kind of feel like Grohl and even Chris, the other guy in Nirvana, are examples of, but again, that's Gen X. I think what you're talking about are... A, a, a different generation of, of people mm. who, I mean, are these Tinder apps and stuff like that's a, that's a different thing. Yeah. It's a different world. I was talking to my best friend's dad yesterday and he's in his like pushing 80 and, um, you know, I wanted to talk to him. He said he was born in 1944. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to talk to him because he was born in California and, uh, you know, down by where the monkeys and the fucking whatever all those bands were beach boys <laughs> and i wanted to talk to him about like being a kid in the 50s and being 15 and like what's it like to like ask a girl's dad if you can hold her hand you know what i'm saying like tell me about that um but also what he revealed to me is like some of the biggest scumbags that ever lived come from that time That's right. and i and it is kind of nice to go into a direction where i the younger the guys get that I sleep with, the more I realize that like consent is really a big, I mean, it's just like a big player in foreplay now. Mm -hmm. Like pause. Are you sure you want to do this? And then they want like an enthusiastic response from you. And I'm like, bitch, like, <laughs> you know, to a certain extent, like I am naked here <laughs> having a good time with you. Like, <laughs> But no, it's not true. I, I actually found it like very endearing um, when mm -hmm. it first started happening. I was like, this is sweet. I really like that you keep checking in with me because it's not like 
that's not happened to me before. Honestly, I have been in the Aziz Ansari situation where the girl was with a celebrity that maybe she wasn't sure about having sex with, but you really want that person to like you. And they're kind of like pressuring you into that situation. And you're giving all of the body like language signals that you don't want to, and they're ignoring them. Mm -hmm. Like when I read that article, I was like, like I never screamed me too because of that. But also I could relate to that woman's experience. And, you know, it didn't traumatize me when it happened, but I remember it very clearly. And I remember being like, eh, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe I could have spoke up. And I, and, you know, you learn from those experiences and you do speak up the next time, hopefully. Um, but yeah, it's like, it's a, it's a thing that I wish maybe somebody would have been like, Hey, like, are you sure? Are you good? And I would have been like, actually, you know, maybe if somebody would have asked, I would have been like, we could put the gimp back in the down. box if you want. <laughs> I wish I was that freaky and cool. <laughs> Seriously, some people do some elaborate shit and I mm -hmm. think it's amazing. I'm a little, I'm closer to vanilla. I'm not going to lie. You had somebody in on your podcast, web series, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to call it a podcast. It's a web series for now. It's hopefully going to become a podcast. I did the first one. This woman said something along the lines that the things that would be totally inappropriate outside of the bedroom mm, are sometimes yeah. the hottest things inside the bedroom. Alice. And, and I struggle with that. Really? Yes. What do you mean struggle? Because I was, I was raised in, uh, in an all-female house mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so my mom had cosmopolitan mm -hmm. and that was one of the first magazines i ever read mm -hmm. way too young because all it is to me is how crappy men are and how how really? what what women have to do to fix men wow that's not what i got from it at all good my that's... whole experience was how women can please their man how women can keep their man how women can be more interesting to attract the right man <laughs> how that's all i ever read i don't know what magazine you're reading so we agree it's a bad magazine i mean i haven't read it lately but i don't like that i mean that's part of the reason why what girls like is it exists is because women are pretty much like formed from birth to be like at the service of someone else like constantly our purpose is to bring pleasure we think you know or somebody put it in our head like it's a longer <laughs> list than that food yeah no, babies totally. all clean the fucking house how can you be good at it for someone else right period be totally and selfless. that's that's what it means to be a successful woman not actually let's jordan do not edit that part <laughs> out <laughs> um but what it what is presented to you as the path to being a successful woman is that everyone likes you and thinks you're the greatest like host when it comes to someone else's experience with you. Mm -hmm. And it's like it takes so much training and unlearning to come back to, well, what makes me happy? Right. Like, what do I like? And actually, I'm way more awesome for other people when I'm in my purest joy. But holy shit, I have to stop myself and be like, wait a minute, are you doing this because you want to do it? Or are you doing it because you think they would really like it yes. if you did it? And it's not like never do that, you know? I don't want to never be of service. I do like being of service. But it went from being 100% of the time I was just worried about pleasing other people to maybe now it's like, 50% of the time, mm -hmm. which still doesn't feel balanced, but feels better. I don't want to completely eradicate, you know, <laughs> selflessness, <laughs> mm -hmm. but I don't think it's actually serving anyone when you totally abandon yourself and don't think about yourself, you become like resentful and shitty. One of your guests was talking about the difference of being an asker and being a pleaser. Mm, and I like that too. Mm. A lot. Yeah. Because we're taught that we're being selfish when we ask. Oh, my God. People love it when you ask. People <laughs> they love do? it. Yeah, because it takes so much of the guesswork out. Mm. Could you? I mean, she says it, so I'm going to quote her. I'm going to quote her. And she says, oh, fuck. We can insert it. Oh, really? Sure. So cool. I will. Who, who are we this. inserting? 
the girl who says that. The okay. difference between, so she's um, Iris is her name. I like a little bit of poetry, you know, and and like very specific language. Um, and I love, I love, love, love a continual feedback stream. Talk to me. If I'm doing a thing and you're like, yeah, that's not really doing anything for me. Like, tell me, just say that. I think there's a lot of ego in sex and people are um, worried about hurting their partner's feelings or having their feelings hurt, you know, and pulling the ego out and just being like, we are two bodies trying to make each other feel good. And we have completely different experiences and completely different nervous systems and completely different ways of talking about and being in our bodies. Like, tell me, make your tongue soft and wide, you know, instead of just like softer, but really tell me like what, if I was doing this to myself, what would I be doing? That is so specific and powerful because then I'm like, oh shit, I know exactly what to do to make this person feel good. That is the best. That is the best. I don't, even when people say something very simple, like, can I have this? I'm like, fuck yeah, you can. <laughs> I never would have known that that's what you wanted right now. And it's like, you know, when you're, I mean, it's nice to rock someone's world totally spontaneously and by accident, mm -hmm. but it's also nice when people can take the guesswork out of it. And I really think it's way more sexy than being like, what can I do for you? What do you want? Like, I think it's like, it puts a lot of pressure on me when people ask me what I want. But if I know how to just ask for what I want, I think it's hot. If I feel powerful and that person feels empowered to please me. I had a very shy girlfriend for a little while who I fucking loved. And she just would not ask for anything. But that's the whole thing. It is kind of the thing. Yeah. And so I said to her, I said, what if I told you that refusing to receive is the same as being selfish? Totally. And so how about this? I'm going to write down three things that I want. Mm -hmm. And you write three things that you want. And we're going to, at the count of three, switch papers. And you better fucking <laughs> be real. <laughs> about what you want. But then this comes back to the circle of consent, right? Like you can't tell someone that they have to want something. If their whole, <laughs> seriously, some people really feel like receiving pleasure is an uncomfortable place. Yeah. Them. It's a super uncomfortable place for them. They don't want to be receiving. I, it took me a long time to be okay with it, but I, mm -hmm. I was terrible at receiving oral pleasure because I was like, it's just me getting pleasure. And I have all these feelings of like guilt and shame. And I'm way more comfortable when we're both, you know, at the same time experiencing something. And I'm not a big 69 person. So it was really about sex for me. And mm -hmm. luckily I'm like one of the 0.03% of women who can like orgasm from penetration. Mm. But, um, yeah, if I didn't have that, I would just be like <laughs> extremely miserable because I could not receive pleasure. And that's fair, too. Like mm -hmm. the circle of consent says I want like I'm giving you pleasure for my pleasure. Yeah. And it's like you have to accept that you have to accept that somebody else doing something to you is how they get off. So what what got you into receiving? Have, have you gotten there yet? Well, yeah, um, yes. <laughs> OK, what, what turned the corner for you? Um, I mean, to a certain extent, let's just be real to a certain extent. I'm really turned off by people who give disingenuously, mm -hmm. you know, who are like, oh, I'm going to go down on you. And then they do it, but you can tell that they don't like it and they don't want to, and that they're only doing it to like lubricate the area so then they can better penetrate you and they don't even stay down there for like a minute you know mm. i don't like that but when someone wants to like then it was just about me getting over my i don't want to say self-hatred because that sounds like dramatic but if that's what it is is that what it is i mean it's a version of that it's like i why don't i feel like i deserve pleasure just for me when I love doing it for other people in so many ways in my life. Why don't I deserve to just lay back and enjoy something? And yes. I really had to like force myself to be like, first of all, 
do you think that's true? Do you think it's true that you don't deserve to just lay back and let somebody please you? And if you do, continue to force yourself into that situation until you relax. Um, obviously, I'm not just like stopping guys on the corner being like, you go down on me, <laughs> you know. But when I have the opportunity to be in that situation, not to say no or sh- or get nervous or shy or shake my head and just to be like, okay, thank you. Okay, so we were asking about your boyfriend situation. Well, we weren't asking, but you were about to ask me, and then I okay. ran away. <laughs> you are 30-something years old. That's true. Uh, by the way, you have done some professional modeling. Oh, my God. Again with this. I am. This is the second time you said this, and I well, they didn't hear the first not time. not true last time. They didn't hear the first time. I know, because, but you're not supposed to repeat the untrue stuff. Um, I, yeah, sure I am. I'm I here to paint a picture. I have gotten paid. I'm here to paint to a take picture. my picture. Nobody's paid you for this? No, I have gotten paid to take okay, my picture. Okay, that, that makes you a model. That does not make me a model. If, if somebody, okay, okay, fine. I'm a model. If it's somebody true. paid me to give them a hand job, guess what I am? It's not the same. Rich. <laughs> <I'm doing laughs> um, okay, you're a beautiful woman. Thank you. Super educated. Wow. Incredibly talented. Wow, he's really going off. You're, but it's all true. He told me last time that he falls in love with every guest that he interviews. So I true. think he's just like under my spell. Uh, uh, who, who, who did I put out today? Um, bass player for Bob Dylan. I'm in love with you. Too. I mean, I fell in love with every guest I had on. What did Girls you really? Like, totally. One of the questions really you asked. And then you have to edit their episode for a week and a half or whatever it takes. And you're just staring at them. And, you know, I try to take beautiful shots of everybody. You do? And, holy crap. I was just like, ugh, you're but so These were all women. Are you a fluid lady? Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't. I don't have a preference. Have I, you? I, but I have had more men. And I like. Interesting. It's like I tell people all the time. I have like the un, the misfortune of being straight, <laughs> um, but uh, I'm sure that being with women is equally in different ways complicated. I just imagine that it must make so much more sense. Um, but I guess yeah, I've leaned towards straight, even though I think that women are just fucking amazing, and I have dated women. <gasps> I've dated women, and I think that in those dating women experiences that I had, I happen to be the more masculine one. And so because of that, I fall into a role. Also, I have this idea in my head that, like, I'm going to be the Prince Charming you always wish. Because all these women have dated men, at least the ones that I've. And it's like, I'm going to show you. Like, I'm going to be the guy you all wish existed. And it's not that fucking hard, actually. But, like, it did get pretty expensive. <laughs> expensive? <laughs> well, yeah, because I'm, like, paying for everything and, oh. like, taking these girls out and, like, being a gentleman, walking them to the door and, like, kissing wow. them. But, like, waiting and, you but know, lesbians cook- are not, like, gay men or, like, women who date women are not, like, gay men who are just, like, let's go in the bathroom and fuck this out. Like, most women are, like, let's talk and be intimate and get close and da 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 And I think there was just... I was just, I just happened to fall on women who wanted me to be the more aggressive one. And I think that I'm just a little bit submissive. Um, So I kind of was hoping that somebody else would take the lead and it never really happened. So even though I was open to, and I'm still open to having experiences with women, it just never happened because I'm just kind of like, I kind of turn into a girl. And then we're just both like, are you going to do something? (laughs) I don't know. Are you going to do something? So then I just kind of was always like, maybe we should just be friends. Like this isn't easily going to the next level. And so it was a lot of like me friend zoning myself. (laughs) And, you know, when it came to dating like real lesbians, I think I always felt like very self-conscious about not being for sure if that was something I was going to like and not wanting anyone to feel like I was like trying it out with them. I'm sure I could have asked and somebody would have been okay with it. 
maybe if that's where they were at, but I felt like very self-conscious about not wanting to like run my experiment. Like it, it felt fine with like women who were also kind of dating men and women, but I think the person who would have had more to like teach me or been able to like take my hand and like be like, this is how you do this um, was probably a lesbian. And I was just like scared of like disrespecting any woman ever. I'm like, <laughs> I really don't care that much about men's feelings, but <laughs> I really care a lot about women's feelings. Same. Mm. It's not true. I I mean, here's the thing. I've asked guys to spank me on my butt and they were like, I don't know. Like, that sounds intense. And I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> like, grow a pair and right. give me a spanking on the, like, plushiest part of my body. You're not going to hurt me. They're like, and they're super, like, there's nothing worse than, like, a half-assed spanking. Like, I'm, a, I'm afraid to hurt you spanking. Why did you want a spanking? I mean, there isn't some, like, deep, dark-rooted reason. I've never asked for a spanking. I'm sure, I mean, like, I could think of, like, cartoons that I saw as a kid where the, like, you know, is getting, like, spanked. Like, I, per my parents never, like, spanked me on my butt. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we got to a point where I was getting slapped in the face, but Ooh. never, and I don't like when people hit me in my face. So it's not like some childhood trauma situation. I just think that, like, essentially when you spank me, I get to feel like this hot burning sensation that like tapers off. It doesn't last. It feels safe, but like dangerous at the same time. And it's like a little bit bad. I think that that's like what makes things sexy is that it's like a little bit bad, a little bit gross, a little bit you're not supposed to. That's like what makes things sexy. The naughtiness. A little bit. Yeah. Is lingerie naughty to you? Um... I like lingerie a lot. I don't know if it's naughty, but he, yeah, everything's on a scale, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I personally wouldn't have been offended if Louis C.K. jerked off in front of me. But I could see how for some women that's, like, totally traumatizing. Right. And I don't get to tell. Like, everything is on this crazy-ass scale. Like, mm -hmm. I would have thought it was, like, funny and pathetic, you know? <laughs> but some people were like, what the fuck? This is insane. Um, and I feel the same way about, like, sex. Like, I was here two seconds ago being like, oh, I guess I'm a little vanilla. But to some people, I am a fucking certified freak. Like, that I know that I like certain things and, you know, I pushed my bed in front of the mirror one time so that I could watch the sex that we were having. And the guy was like, what the hell? You're so crazy. I can't believe you did that. And I was just like, really? I mean, it seems pretty basic to me. Have you been in love before? If you have to think about it, I think the answer is no. I mean, in retrospect, aren't we all kind of like, oh, I guess I wasn't really in love okay, with that the, person. <laughs> I'm saying obsessed. Yeah. Like. Totally. I also, mean, that doesn't, also, that's like infatuation, right? That's not love. Like, then it becomes like, what is love? What is it to be in love? Like, uh, oh, I know all these answers. I know question. the answers. And then, and then and I. And it doesn't like, sound like you were. Which well, is, here's the thing. When I was. From 13 to 18, I yeah. was, like, in a very toxic relationship with okay. a guy who, like, fucked with my emotions and lied to me and kept secrets. And I was always, like, chasing after him. And all I ever did was think about him and how to please him and being with him. And why doesn't he want to be with me right now? Why isn't he calling me? Da -da -da -da. I don't think that's fucking healthy. But I'm glad that I got it out of my system because I never behaved like that with a man ever again after did that. Did he tell you that he loved you? Yeah. Did he mean it? Yeah. He still means it. He Ooh. still wishes that there was something going on between us to huh. a certain extent. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you fucked that up so bad, bro. <laughs> like, And mm -hmm. also, like, I mean, we could not be less so you, compatible. So you were in love. I mean, was I was obsessed. I was obsessed with him. And mm -hmm. I, was, I think I have, like, core deep abandonment issues. And he showed up when I was 13 years old and took care of me. Hmm. And... He really took care of me. And then I became like terrified that he would leave me. I mm. think. And uh, and yeah, I just wanted to be with him all the time. And it's a super unhealthy way to love someone. And I don't know that that's love. Right. You know? I it's mean, but what experience in your actual life has led you to believe that forever with someone is like probable it's not probable, but oh, okay. you. But it only has to happen with one other person in the whole planet. Is yeah. is is it? Are your parents still together? Hell no. 
Okay, well, I'm just wondering where you got this like blind faith from. It's faith. Sure. It's not based on anything. Yeah. Why, I mean, here's the thing. I do think it happens for like 0.2% oh. of the population. Yes. And that's cool. And the rest of the world's just suffering. No. Uh, see, I've reached a point now where I'm in a place where, well, you were about to ask me earlier, like, have I had a serious boyfriend? And yeah. the answer to that question is I haven't had, well, to me, a serious boyfriend is like a relationship of like a year at least. Okay. Does that seem fair? Yeah. And so I haven't had a serious relationship in over a decade. Do you do the breaking up? Um, I think that, I think that it's probably 50-50 split. I think that I, do you do the breaking up? I think that people have lost interest in me and faded out on me. Impossible. Or chose other people. Back to your infatuation with your guests. Um... <laughs> But, or the buttering up of the guests, right? Exactly. It's like, ah. um, but I think that mostly my reason for breaking because I'm very choosy about mm -hmm. people. Well, less, well, we can get to that, but I'm very choosy usually, or I have been because I was always trying to like only, I was, I was like either dating someone who I thought I could end up with or I wasn't dating anybody, you know? So I was very choosy. Um, end up with in love or just in bed? No, yeah, that's a good question. In life, like, oh, like I was only dating people that I thought I, you're I mean, really going for every it. once in a while. I would be like, you know what? Fuck this shit. And I would try to have a one night stand and I would hate it because mm. I was extreme. I was like, I am a demisexual person who only enjoys sex with people that I have an emotional connection with. So anytime I tried to have a one night stand, um, it was just like a mess. I was, yeah. I would like crack up laughing. And even one guy, I was like laying next to him after and being like, that was terrible for me. I, I had a terrible time and it has nothing to do with you and everything with my inability to be in this moment and enjoy the feeling like I don't know you and I'm, I'm puzzled the whole time this is happening. Like, and I'm thinking like too much about myself and what I look like and my body and how you're feeling. I'm, I can't close my eyes and just be like, Ugh, I'm so glad that we're having this moment together. You know what I'm saying? And some yeah. people can do that casually and I just really could not. And I still can't do that with a stranger, you know? Actual people do not desire or, I mean, make up whatever fucking terms you want and find what fits for you. And you're maybe a combination of multiple things. But but the idea of demisexual is that, like, there's asexual, right? And then demi means half. So, like, some version of half sexual, which means, like, I really only want, like, I used to go a year without having sex, no problem. And I wouldn't even think about it. And I had some friends who would be like, are you insane? How do you even like function? Like, and I was like, I don't know. I, I what? Like, how often are you having sex? Like, I had no idea. And they were like having Tinder dates and having a different sex partner every week and just like getting that need out. And I just like didn't have the need until I really liked someone. And then all I want to do is like fuck them. But um, mm -hmm. I have to really like someone to feel that pull to have sex. Yes. Um, and masturbation is just like you know, brushing your teeth. Like it, it really wasn't like uh, I'm super horny, so I'm going to masturbate. Like it was like masturbating is this thing. It's just like a part of life. And, you know, it wasn't mm -hmm. like a sexual desire thing so much, which is, I guess, doesn't make sense to some people, but it made sense to me. So you haven't been in love in a long time. I, that's not true. I have loved people. I can love. So I think for me, the difference between love and in love is I can love you for who you are and appreciate you as a person and enjoy spending time with you. And that's great. And I can enjoy you and us. And maybe hopefully that builds to being in love with someone. But for me, being in love with someone is I imagine a future where you and I are together through this weird thing called life, potentially forever, hopefully forever which it's, that's always the goal, you know, but I'm not like holding out for it and I don't have any expectation of it. Mm. It would be totally fine being in love with someone for two years and then it changing and then hopefully being in love with someone else for 10 years and it changing and hopefully, you know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. that would be okay with me too. But hopefully the, the goal is to work on it and continue to love each other through the whole thing. I mean, that that's ideal. And so for me, the difference between love is 
seeing a person for who they are and appreciating them. And I guess the limitation is understanding that you're probably not a perfect fit for each other. And in love being seeing a person for who they are, appreciating and loving them and feeling like with this person, I could make a life. And if Why did you change your webcast Web into series. a podcast? <laughs> um, I was doing these. Thank you for asking. <laughs> I was doing these um, kind of like 13 minute videos um, that were like very visually driven. And I thought, I don't know why I thought women would really like that, you know, like po moving portraits and a story and um a lot of people were telling me that they weren't watching it. And some of the women who were in the videos were watching it were um, telling me they didn't like the way they looked. And that was making me feel bad because, you know, they are so beautiful. But also, like, I don't want another reason. My pop, my web series to be another reason why women don't feel great in their own skin because mm. I struggle with that. Mm. Um, and also I felt like I listened to long form content and that is what I like. So I should mm -hmm. be making a podcast that I would want to listen to. Yeah. And mostly I felt like by only talking to women about sexual pleasure, I was doing sexual liberation a disservice kind of. Because even though it's nice to hear about that stuff and have somewhere to go to hear about that stuff, we see women as purely sexual or as professional and I hope that we can see all women as professional and sexual because they are. And so I don't want to hear any more stories about my teacher. We found out she had an OnlyFans and then she got fired. You know, like you should find out that your teacher has an OnlyFans and be like, cool, this girl hustles. Like, you know, <laughs> just like or you should find out that some politician nudes got leaked and you should be wondering why you're saying this or who leaked them. And that is an ex like a, a breach of privacy, mm -hmm. but you should not be thinking, Oh, this woman is a danger to state and country. Now we can no longer take her advice. <laughs> like, of course she's sexual and sent naked pictures of herself to somebody. Mm -hmm. And why can't women be open about who they are? I mean, I feel like also all of this weird shit, men too, you know, all of this weird shit that happens with men sexually, it's only because they have to like hide themselves and pretend like they're not sexual and then they become sexual deviants. Why do you think sex is still such a hang up oh, for people? My God. Well, here's the thing. I struggle with it because like we said earlier, like because it's taboo and because it's gross and because it's like shouldn't it, it like, you know, it's like that's what makes it hot. Right. Um, so I don't want it to be just chocolate. You mm -hmm. know, I don't want it to be something that's so easy to talk about. I don't mind when people are a bit private about their sexuality. That's mm -hmm. fine. Um, but the fact that it's demonized still to this extent, that is so annoying. That is really very annoying. <laughs> like no one is here <laughs> without sex. Mm -hmm. So stop pretending like you don't want it and stop pretending like you don't want to hear about it and you don't want to see it. And it's so crazy to me. <laughs> it's so crazy to me. It's 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 one reason I wish that Christians who I am part of mm. would stand up to the anti-abortion people because the anti-abortion people try Aren't to they the same. Well, they, that's the thing. They try to root it into religion. And it has nothing to do with religion. Mm. It's not in the Bible. Mm. And there's shitloads of stories. There's shitloads of people in the Bible. Mm. Not one of them had an abortion. And God said, hey, now. <laughs> it's actually funny. There's like, you know, some texts in the Torah where they've like looked it up or in the Bible where they're like, actually, God said 
if the woman is in any kind of danger whatsoever, you should definitely get rid of the fetus. This is what I prefer. That's true. No, that's, that oh, part okay. is true. Yeah. They, 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 like preserve the woman before the that's right. potential the for... Thing. Yeah. 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 I still don't even want to use religion in government because <laughs> if you don't believe in my Bible, why mm. should you have to... Plus, I don't really... Under... I've read it five times and I still don't understand it. Mm. And I and I work with it mm. you know, so that I can understand it. I want to be knowledgeable. Mm. But I feel like once we can solve the abortion thing, once politicians can stop getting elected because they are pro-choice, then I feel like a real sexu sexual revolution will happen. Mm. And we can have a lesbian Supreme Court justice <laughs> or we can have a gay senator from Alabama. You know, like it's good. It, I feel like we're getting there. And I love the fact that kids today accept trans kids at school and they defend them. You haven't heard this? I mean, I fucking hope so. Any kind of bullying is like totally right. uh, like unacceptable at this point. I feel like. I mean, even for the people who are like, it builds character. I was bullied as a kid and. I don't know. I don't know how much character it built in me. Right. And it was like, I feel like I'm, I'm dealing with those, like the, the aftermath of those little, like, you know, kids would be like, you have a mustache or you look like a boy or you did it or Natushi banana or whatever the fuck. Like depends what, what, what age Tushi you are. Natushi banana? Natushi. My first name is Natasha. Ah. Natushi banana. Um, but it's like, you know, different ages spark different kinds of bullying. Yeah. Um, but all of it just like, it stays with you because you as a kid are so fragile that you internalize what these kids are saying about you and you just take it on like, Oh my God, I must be defective. I must be broken. I must be unattractive. I must. Da, da, da. Um, but, but this is why your web series podcast, whatever you want to call it. And here in LA here in motherfucking LA are so valuable because we don't know if a kid's going to listen and I do hope a kid does listen and here's you <laughs> and here's me and it, and, it, and get something positive out of this, you know, because I was reading Cosmo and it fucked with my head as a kid. <laughs> 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 no. That's Suddenly you got shy. Oh, it's just a funny thing to talk about. It's a funny thing to talk about. You prefer not. Well, to so we were talking about women who we were talking about coming from. <laughs> penetrative sex <laughs> and you were saying that you would you you felt like there should be a sh horn on the sh t the edge the like I, I was saying that the reason my belief is the reason that women don't have uh, orgasms through penetrative sex humping is because <laughs> the male body doesn't stimulate the clitoris right and and, and then i <laughs> made a kind of serious <laughs> joke about why i've stopped sleeping with men who are very thin <laughs> or, or I guess like I'm not very flexible in the way of like doing the open splits, you know? So mm. it's like, I kind of need there to be enough man or fat, whatever you want to call it to fill the gap between my legs. Oh mm -hmm. my God, this is getting graphic all of a sudden, but when there's a little bit more belly and also pubic hair, men stop shaving your pubic hair off. Really? Yeah, because friction makes heat, and heat is super stimulating. Hmm. Um, and so whenever, like, that part, like, just, like, whenever this is happening, essentially this, it's, like, great. I want there to be the noise of, like, hair and hair, like, <laughs> against each other. Because that's, <laughs> like, yeah, maybe play music if you don't like those kinds of noises. But that mm -hmm. is, like, when I'm going to come. And, like, I have noticed that, like, when there's, like, a soft belly to like rub on, that's like how I'm gonna come. And when guys are trying to do this noise, that's how you never make a girl come. When you're doing this, she's not gonna come. But if you are like, this is the sound of huh. two bodies that are about to like make a fire. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> you're about to like let a, some sparks go. So dad bod, yes. Un you know what? The first time I heard dad bod, I was like, fuck that. I was like, wait, women have to be stacked, but guys get to just have these like loose bodies. We and never said life was fair. Here's the thing. I don't think either is true. I think I for sure feel sexier when there's more of me to grab and I feel Ooh. juicy and like whatever. I've been 98 pounds and I've been 140 pounds. What are you now? 120. 
somewhere between 120 and 125. How do you feel? I feel I feel pretty good. You know, I think we're all fucking broken and we all feel like we could lose 10 pounds, you know, but But you said you feel better when you're on the higher end of the scale. I mean, I feel more sexually activated Mm -hmm. and I feel more sexy during sex for the listeners out there with six packs. Yeah. Here's is, the thing. is a six pack a good alternative to a dad bod belly? A beer I belly? I mean, I, I have thought that, you know, but a lot of times six packs come with like super thin bodies. Like if your hip bones are mm. protruding, you know, like so far out and like I can't access you if you if your like pubic area to like lower stomach is not accessible by my body easily then it is going to be really hard for me to come. But if I can like grind on you in a way that like I'm accessing as much of your skin as possible, then yeah, like friction. I mean, you could put your arm between my legs and move it back and forth and make me come. You know what I'm saying? Like that's how simple clits really are. Like all that like grinding that in one of the web series too, the girl talks about it where she's like, shh, you know, she was super Christian and she thought that like whatever she was doing with the dry humping, that that could not be orgasms. <laughs> it must be different when you're having sex with someone. And then she finally level. had a, a, a sexual orgasm. Uh huh. And then she was like, holy shit, it was the same orgasm as the dry humping one. And, yeah. you know, we could get into like internal G spots and, it, you know, vaginal orgasms and squirting and all of that stuff. It's like different stuff. But most people want to have a clitoral orgasm, I think. And, you know, th- there are women who have anal sex orgasms and I have zero like experience with that, nor do I want to. So I'm not the person to ask. But for me, the part that seemed to get you really excited was that I like a guy who's a little bit meatier because it works better for my body. This is my favorite podcast now. <laughs> Sure. I mean, I only discovered this recently because I was like extremely superficial. And who I, who knew a guy's belly? Who knew? Is his secret weapon? Okay, let's not get crazy. It's not like Homer Simpson belly. Like it doesn't have to be like. Yeah, but but it could be. I mean, yeah, totally, it could be. bring this back to me for a second Please. i have pretty wow. bad almost crippling at some points in my life crippling facial dysmorphia no and i've done tons of research about it and really understood it and it has helped me a lot just understanding it as a disease has helped me a lot what what has helped you researching researching facial dysmorphia and understanding that it's not just me seeing myself in a certain way and thinking that I was like, it a deformed. book that you read is there you know what there's like um a youtube channel all about like dysmorphia really which is like lectures and lectures serious people who have studied like the science of dysmorphia then yeah and you can watch like like there are people there's one that's pretty interesting where you like essentially the experiment they do to see if you have dysmorphia or not yeah one way they do that is that they put your face in a machine and they scan your eyes and they tell you to look at pictures of people's faces some are yours some aren't and the way that your face the way that your eyes scan someone's face yeah is different when you have dysmorphia and when you don't huh so when you have when you don't have dysmorphia the way you scan someone's face is that you're like eyes lips nose eyes lips nose you kind of like you know, you just look at the different parts of their face. Yeah. Um, but when you have dysmorphia, you'll be like the right eyebrows higher and the the right um, lip bow or the left lip bow is like a little messed up. Right eyebrow, left lip bow, right eyebrow, right eyebrow, right eyebrow. You like stay focused on those perceived flaws. Um, and so you have like this hyper focus problem mm. on things that you perceive as. Did you take great. this test? No, no, no. But I I have watched other videos where, you know, males who have had multiple plastic surgery things and talk about their dysmorphia and they talk about how, I mean, when I talk about my dysmorphia, I talk about 
sometimes it feels like I'm looking at my face through a clown mirror, like, Mm -hmm. you know, like a circus mirror. And it's never exactly the same, but like my teeth and mouth feels like very pronounced to me. And my eyes feel like, I mean, everything just feels like it's twisted a little bit and like really not symmetrical at all. And my nose, I, I, you know how I know one time I, for a few years, I had this like bursted blood vessel under my eye and it looked like a little spider, like a little red spider on my face and it got bigger and bigger. And so I eventually went to a dermatologist and lasered it off. Mm -hmm. But my mom told me that it would go away on its own. And so I waited and it got to a point where I would see a picture of myself and for the first, you know, part of a second, all I would see was that red thing. And Mm -hmm. it just looked like it covered my whole face. Mm. And then slowly my face would come into focus, but it was like the little, but still it was the thing that took up most of my attention. And I, I wouldn't allow, I have, Actually, I still don't really let people take pictures of me. It is funny that you think I'm a model, but I run away from any picture that's not like professional or controlled by me. I'm terrified of it. People mm. turn a com- camera on me and I I become so nervous. I can't stand still. I look 10,000 different directions. My face contorts like it's it's very uncomfortable. But so the only reason that I study celebrities faces and like the plastic surgery that they have had done is because, you know, I, I always just been like, how can people be so perfect? You know? And Mm -hmm. then you realize, oh, they can't, they get work done. And that's totally fine. If you want to do that, I have no judgment about it. I do have tons of judgment on myself about doing it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, oh, you're this person who like values natural beauty and all this stuff, but you can't just fucking love yourself for how you are. And you need to make all these changes and you, you want to make all these changes, but also like I'm exhausted I'm exhausted from the amount of time that I spend thinking about how big my nose is or how like unsymmetrical my face is. It is, it just takes up so much time that sometimes I wish just get this fucking surgery done and then hopefully you'll, you'll be able to think about something else, you know? And I had, I struggled with food addiction at one time and I was able to recover from that. And it's kind of a similar thing. Like when you struggle from food addiction, it takes up all of your mental facilities. What, what type of addiction? Um, I just, you know, it wasn't like I needed to be stuffing my face with donuts all day long. But essentially, like, I was always thinking about what I was going to eat, who I was going to eat with, where we were going to eat it, what the menu was there. And then I would immediately after eating it, I would think about the next thing I was going to eat. And pretty soon I was like in this loop of, eating things and regretting that I ate them and feeling guilty about it. And like, that's all addiction is, right? Yeah. Like you're just do, obsessing about this thing that you need to have. You have it. You're satisfied from having it for like five minutes before you fall into this like hole of like feeling shitty about it. What age were you during that, this part? Um, I was in my early 20s, like 25. Hmm. And I think it was, I was going, well, I was just like coming into myself as like a food person, personal chef for a person. And it was very easy for me to hide my addiction behind being this foodie person and is this the person that we were talking about or different uh, client? well i i hadn't gotten to that place yet i hadn't mm. become that person so on your way yet. to this but on my way to becoming the person who is known for not only like knowing restaurants in la which i've always been known for but like making food that's oh great. really you're known for this yeah I mean, before there was Yelp and still today, like, which I appreciate. But at the same time, I'm like, bitch, Google it. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> um, but, you know, people will text me and be like, I have an, somebody's flying in from here. To, where should I take them? Da, da, da. And it's like, I'm flattered. That's nice that you want my tip. But also probably I looked it up. Um, it's annoying to you now. You don't want to be that person. I mean, I understand also like the internet can be very unreliable and they just pick the trendiest place and that's not always the best place. And I, it's fine. I appreciate it. I have a small enough circle where it's not annoying to me, but imagine being Anthony Bourdain or Gordon Ramsay and just all day long, people are like, where should I eat? Where should I eat? Where should I go eat? I'm having a meeting with my brother. I have a, I'm going to propose to this person business meeting. It's like, holy shit. Your uh-huh. Instagram is because I want people to DM you and ask you questions. <laughs> uh, yeah. You don't have a Twitter. No, I don't have a Twitter. So your Instagram is... Zoracha. Zoracha. 
like Sriracha. Um, yeah, my name Zora Z O H R A. Is that how most people spell yeah. it? Zora? Yeah. Um, where I'm from, it is. How is somebody who is a personal chef who takes pictures of of food? Mm. What do you, what do you, what do you call that job? Food photographer. Food photographer. <laughs> That fancy term. So so how does that person get over this food addiction thing? You know what? There's a, a brilliant man and author. His name's Michael Pollan. Have you heard of him? Maybe. He wrote uh, The Omnivore's Dilemma, which is like really popular. And he wrote this book called The Botany of Desire. And he's now very into like mushrooms and psychedelics. Anyway. Um, Tell me more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You should read his books. Um, but in the omnivore's dilemma, I think one of the things that he expressed, like one of the issues he tries to tackle is obesity, which I never have experienced. Plus I, whatever. I never have experienced obesity, but I, um, but you're working on it, (laughs) but I listened to what he had to say when he spoke, he was like, if people had to cook everything they ate from scratch, then obesity would not be a problem in this country. Because you should see how long it takes to make a burger and fries from scratch. Like you would not want to do that shit. It is so much easier to just make a salad with a protein. Um, So if you had to go to the butcher and get the side of the rump roast, whatever it is, and grind it into ground beef. Even just buy the grind. Just let's say just you're buying the ground beef. Okay. But you have to make the buns from scratch and you have to make the french fries from scratch. Like that takes a really, it's not fast food anymore. It's super slow. Are, are you snacking as you're uh, doing this? Are you eating potato chips as you're? Uh, I guess you got to make your own no. potato chips. Yeah, you too. can't make your. Yeah, if you, if you want potato chips. So I did that. I had I had committed to 360 days of eating in, but I really only made it to like the six month mark, um, and it started to get boring and easy at that point. And I had really overcome my addiction by the six months, oh. um, and I ended up getting booked on a modeling gig for Teva. And it was like two weeks in Arizona and Texas. And I didn't want to be the model on set who was like, I can't eat this unless I made it from scratch. (laughs) So I just kind of like ate whatever and then fell off the wagon of cooking for yourself. It's hard to come back and be like, oh, okay, I'm not going to eat out after I have been eating out for two weeks. Um, But really, I feel like that is what cured me. And, you know, I have moments where I'm like, oh, I'm not relapsing, but I'm showing some behavior that's like not great. But I'm really good at reining it in. I was going to use one of your questions. Oh, okay. I like it. When did you When did you discover your pleasure? Your pleasure. Uh huh. That's a pretty fair question, right? <laughs> You're like, I like my questions. I do. Yeah. How old were you? When I dis- are you talking about in a sexual way? Are we going back to that? These are your questions, girl. What do you mean when you say them? I think that my intention, I like that it's open to interpretation. That's what Mm -hmm. I really like about that question. Yeah. Um, But I think my intention with it was, when did you discover that your body like did something more than just like eat, sleep, shit, play? (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Like, when did you discover that there was like another level of like physical ecstasy kind of situation? And and the people's answers to that. Mm -hmm. I love your podcast. Series. And and I, <laughs> I'm gonna call whatever I want to. Well, it's not a it's it's gonna be a podcast, but it'll be different. I call so. it that because you got mad at me for not asking you about your podcast the last time. <laughs> I did. Yes. Well, you have this very big, grand way of expressing yourself when you say you get mad at you got mad at me. It sounds the, so bad. The cat was hissing at me. It was horrible. <laughs> Um, no, it was wh- just what, after, and I was like telling you about it, and I was like, "Oh yeah, bummer." I should like. By the way, it's all about hot chicks <laughs> talking about sex and orgasms and clits. Oh my it's god! Like, what? Take two. Um, the reason th- th- that I like your web series so much and that question so much is because when the guest that you had explained that first mm. feeling of touching themselves, usually mm. mm-hmm. or grinding yeah. up against something. <laughs> sure. They felt so guilty and they felt like it's got to be a secret. Totally. And that fascinates me because we we're not taught that part. It's so innate. It's in us somehow. And and okay, I believe in God and the devil. Mm -hmm. And so when when a gorgeous girl says, 
I have a spot on my face that's driving me crazy, I think, oh, that's, of course, that's the devil doing his job. He's like, you know, by the way, did you notice this? Did you notice how fat your ass was? Do you remember when he looked at your friend more than he looked at you? If somebody said, did you notice how fat your ass was? I would be like, really? Oh, my God, thank you. (laughs) And then the devil has to think of something else to say. (laughs) Totally. So anyhow, that's what I thought about when (laughs) these women were saying I couldn't tell anybody about touching myself that first time. Uh, So did you feel guilty your first time? Did you feel like you had to keep it a secret? I mean, you really want to talk about (laughs) that. Only if you do. Um, Because I got other questions. You see my stack of notes. (laughs) Um, The first time that I can remember experiencing that was in my grandmother's like bathtub she had like a big jacuzzi style bathtub in her bathroom it was the one with the jets and it was like you could fit four people in there what part town morocco um and she had like the the you know the thing you wash yourself with was like the shower head and it had like the pressure version and i remember like putting it under the water and like kind of grazing myself this is the detachable shower head yeah yeah exactly. which is a european kind of a thing Mm-hmm, totally. You don't see a lot of those here. I mean, there's a few I now. Have, I have one. Um, I have one, and I have broken it. <laughs> um, <laughs> You've used it too much. Yeah, I've, I've broken it. Um, <laughs> and then I, I honestly, I had to. I used a shower head my whole life. Like I, I all, I never have. I actually one time, I think when I was 31 or something, forced myself to give myself an orgasm with my hand. It took two hours. And it was really hard. Because your device was broken? No, I just was like, well, I didn't bring anything with me. And there was nothing at this hotel in Mexico. And I was like, you have to do this. You have to. Because people make it seem like you don't know. If you don't do this for yourself, you don't know your own body. And you'll never know how to tell somebody what you like, you know. And it's just like, I don't know. I did it. I don't feel like I'm much more like literate in my body. Did you try it with your left hand? (laughs) What? That's what dudes do. Oh, you switch hands? Yeah. Oh, I see. Um, well, no, I was, it took, it was so challenging that I just did it with my right hand, my main hand. Um, well, now, dominant, now you got a little tip. My dominant hand. Um, <laughs> two hours in this Mexican hotel room. So crazy. But anyway, I used shower heads for a really long time and I stopped because I started feeling guilty about water use. And so now <laughs> I have, I just leave my broken shower head the way it is. And I, I have, a because of water. Yeah. And so I invested God bless in hippies. some sex toys. Dude, there's a fucking water crisis. One day where there's not going to be enough water and I'll be sitting there being like, oh my God, I wasted so much water on. (laughs) Um, But anyway, so I was in this bathtub and I. How old? Huh? How old were you? I want to say like five. No. Maybe younger. You somehow have this like built in feeling that it's wrong, but you don't know that it's. um, But you don't know that it's like sexual necessarily. And that's messed up because it's like really confusing. But what are we supposed to do? Encourage little kids to like be sexual? That's fucking weird too. There's not really a good answer. But the be, the answer that we have found is that when you catch little kids being sexual, try not to f- lose your shit and just be like, oh, okay. Like, you know, definitely don't let adults touch you in that way, first of all. And, you know, this is something you might want to explore by yourself. And my grandmother totally didn't go that route. I was a little bit older, thank she God. She caught you. Yeah, my grandmother caught me in a different house in Spain. And she did not talk to me for like two weeks. <gasps> I was just in, in the bathtub. She didn't catch me with someone else. She caught me in the bathtub by myself with her shower head. And she just like walked in, looked at me with this these eyes that could cut glass. And then, and then walked out and just, she just told me that, I was disgusting and that I should not speak to her or address her or look at her. And I was like, oh, that went on for like basically a whole summer break. I have to stop because my friend is coming. Because she was like, you know how much water you just wasted? (laughs) How great was Zora? You know who else we would dress up for, clean up our house and tell all of our secrets to? Our Patreons. When you stoke us, you're saying, Tony, Jordan, here's a new shower head. Here's the most expensive tacos you've ever had. Here's a pair of brand new Pumas. 
Every donation you hand over helps us keep this insane project a rolling. So shout out to our Patreons, Nancy Bronnelman, Sean Atlow, Matt Mills, Sean Wallace, Greg and Molly, Jamie Taylor, Mark Johnson, Kira Ann, Barney Grinky, Ben Welsh, Henry Furman, Jen Adams, The Lonely Chair, Trevor Wilson, Bree Wild, Dougie Gyro, and our newest Patreon, Christina. Want to hear your name at the end of next week's show? Go to patreon.com slash here in LA and give till it hurts. Also, shout out to our Angelinos. To be an Angelino, all you got to do is PayPal. It's 25 bucks or more, and we will list you on the Here in LA website that's about to be done. Maybe it'll never be done, but it'll, uh, one day it'll get done. And your name will be listed there forever. Right now, your name is listed on the blog post, so everybody wins. You will also be given a number to denote how early you got in to make this dream come alive. For example, Angelino number one is Allie Miller. Number two, George Wright. Three, Rita Joanne. Four, Jason Sutter. Five, Grant Houghton. Six, Rob Baker. Seven is Kev Chang. Eight, Brenda Garcia. And nine is John Griffiths. Just PayPal your hard-earned cash to bustblog at gmail.com. Want to support us, but you just spent all your savings on a red barchetta? Well, you can still help. Post your favorite episode on your Facebook. Oh my God, post two. Tweet something nice about this. Anytime, in fact, anytime you see me tweet about this or stick it up on my Facebook or Facebook group and you want to stoke us, just retweet or repost what's going on. You don't have to say nothing. And for God's sake, pray for us. Tell your friends how Here in L.A. is spelled, and then it's on Apple Podcasts and Google and even Spotify. Here in L.A. is produced by myself, Tony Pierce, and a man who just jammed with a member of ZZ Top. Actually, that's that's true. Mr. Jordan Katz. Editing, mixing, and music supervision by Jordan Katz. Songs by Orgone and Jordan Katz. Special thanks to Cindy for creating the logo, Jen for inspiring this, And everyone who has the devil yapping in their ear, nonstop, day and night. Same girl. Same. Same. Same.